Uh, tonight, we're going to do something that may be a little different to some of you, and I'm going to ask you to do this, that you will keep your heart and mind open tonight uh, to a very, very important message that uh, I felt several weeks ago the Lord had laid upon my heart. I was traveling preaching in the state of Michigan, and I had opportunity to speak to a group of college-age young people. And after I was done speaking, I had made some remarks about the importance of evangelism. I had made some remarks about the importance of our building churches, that type of thing. I was speaking to these young people, and some young people came up to me afterwards, and they said, Pastor, they said, uh, we're curious about something. Three different young people, by the way, from three different churches, uh, talked about the fact that their churches had been seriously damaged. Uh, the stories were very similar, though they were different churches. One young man said, he said, at my church, he said, we were a growing church, we were an evangelistic church, we loved everyone, tried to see souls saved, and he said, then somehow in the congregation there came a bit of a stir over a doctrinal matter. A lot of times our churches don't have trouble over uh, so much over the uh, matters of doctrine, do they, but uh, maybe personality or something, but he said there was a stir over a doctrinal issue, and he said we came to understand that there were two groups of people in the church, and one particular group was kind of being formed out of the congregation by some, I think, were leading the charge in regard to this. And at any rate, he was a younger man, so he wasn't paying a lot of attention. But before too long, the church split wide open. And he said, now there's two churches that are very, very weak. They don't have the same witness. The testimony in the community was destroyed. And he said there was a particular doctrinal issue that had arisen in the church. And there are two others that gave similar testimony to this that had arisen in the church. And I asked them, I said, what was the issue that caused the dissension, the church split, and the damaging of the testimony of Jesus Christ and the sacrifice of the soul winning and evangelism of the church? And the young man looked at me and he said, Pastor Monty, he said, the issue is Calvinism. Calvinism. Now, for some of you, that's a word that you've heard bantered about a bit. And, I, and I'm aware that there may even be some here that say, well, Pastor Monty, I identify as a Calvinist. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to listen carefully to the messages that I want to bring because I'm very concerned. I've pastored now the same church for over 14 years, have been in Christian ministry for going on 25 years of my life. I began very early in life in full-time Christian ministry. I have watched the pendulum swing from one extreme to the other. And in my watching of this pendulum swing, I'm becoming increasingly concerned that there is a movement that is more in line with a Calvinistic thinking than we have had in the past, and it is affecting negatively many of our churches, many individuals, and also their ability and their desire to win people to Jesus Christ. I am well aware that there are folks here that may subscribe to some level or another of Calvinism. I also understand that there are varying degrees and different levels. But I'm concerned with what I'm hearing. A church very close to us has lost a number of families to our church. And when some of those families have come our way, I asked one family, he said, why did you come to this church? And the individual said this, said, I cannot reconcile the message I'm hearing in the former church with the message of the Bible. He said, we were told in our church that God hates sinners. God hates sinners. Now, there was a doctrinal background to this, but all this man heard was something different from he's, what he's ever heard uh, any time in his life. He said, Pastor Monty, does God hate sinners? No. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Understand something, young people, this is a serious matter. It has gotten into the churches. Now, right away, someone says, Pastor, well, I subscribe to Calvinism, so I'm not going to listen to another word that you say. And maybe you're out there right now, and you're a little bit irritated that I'm even dealing with this topic. You say, Pastor, I'm a Calvinist, and I'm irritated. Well, pause there for a minute. Your irritation is extremely inconsistent with your Calvinism. Why do you say that? Because if you're really a Calvinist, then you believe... That from before the foundation of the world, God preordained that I would preach these messages to you. <laughs> so you've got it. Don't be angry with me over it. If you're angry with me, you're inconsistent. You need to take it up with God if you're a consistent Calvinist. I'm asking you this, this evening to pay attention as we consider a couple of facts regarding this matter. 
There are some Reformed Christians that believe that Calvinism itself is pure biblical Christianity in its clearest and purest expression. There are some that have gone so far as to say that Calvinism itself is the gospel. One author said Calvinism is the gospel, and to teach Calvinism is in fact to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are a host of evangelical leaders, very popular in our day today, who have become exponents of Calvinism. They are in favor of it. And so they promote its doctrines, sometimes confusing people. Now, I will be honest with you. I have studied this topic for years, not just for a few weeks in preparation for messages, but for years. My greatest concern with Calvinism in its strongest and extreme form is that it does not match with biblical teaching. That is my greatest concern. There are a lot of effects that it may or may not have in churches, but my greatest concern is it does not match with biblical teaching. There is a first doctrine, and many of you are familiar with this, Calvinism. When we talk about this, we're discussing the five points of Calvinism, sometimes described as tulip. You've all heard about this in your Bible class. Uh, Total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, the perseverance of the saints. These are the five things that were established as essential to Calvinist doctrine. And I understand that different people believe in these to varying and different degrees, but there is one of the five that is most significant, because to accept that one ultimately means you must accept the other four, and that is the first part of the TULIP acronym that is total depravity. Now right away someone says to me, Pastor Mahdi, don't you understand that man is sinful? And yes, I fully concur and agree. The Bible teaches that man has been a fallen creature since Adam's transgression in the garden. The New Testament declares that Adam's sin passed upon all men, therefore all men are sinners by nature. Romans 5 verse 12. Man is born in sin. Psalm 51 1. Man goes astray at birth. Psalm 58. And man does not even initiate his own seeking after God. Romans 3 verse 11. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I believe that we all have corrupt sin natures that are bent on sinning, that desire sin, and that are inwardly evil. And by the way, anyone need only look at himself for a little while to determine that that is a biblical truth. And while that is a biblical truth, Calvinism, in the form that it is now appearing on the evangelical landscape, has taken that and gone far beyond the teachings of the Bible. I want everyone to listen carefully. Calvinism today does not just say that man is sinful in his nature and that man is guilty of sinful acts. Calvinism teaches this, that man's sinfulness is in reality an inability to believe the gospel. In other words, genuine Calvinism teaches that there is no possibility of a sinner coming to Christ of his own free will. That in reality, to choose Christ of free will, he cannot, because he does not have a free will, the ability to accept or to reject Christ. You say, Pastor, can you prove that? Yes, I can. In a formal declaration of the essential nature of Calvinism and its doctrines, uh, sponsored by a political and religious state church gathering, it's called the canons of Dort, they made this declaration. They said, therefore, all men without the regenerating grace of the Holy Spirit are neither able nor willing to return to God nor to dispose themselves to reformation. Now, what does it mean? Simply this, that on hearing the gospel, a sinner cannot decide to receive Christ as his savior. He is incapable because of sin. Now, ladies and gentlemen, while the Bible teaches we are sinful, it does not teach an inability to come to know Christ as Savior. Your Bible is open to Ephesians. Let's look at chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 in your Bible, verse number 1. The Bible says this, Ephesians 2, 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past and the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath even as others. Notice the sinfulness of mankind. Verse number 4. 
But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are ye saved. Verse number 6. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he may show forth the exceeding riches of his grace and kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any any man should boast. And right away I hear someone in the crowd who is Calvinistic saying, Aha, Pastor Monty, the Bible teaches that man is dead in trespasses and sins, and I agree. But we'll get into that in a moment. Is it really true that an individual who hears the gospel cannot turn to Christ and receive him. Calvinist Frank Beck made this statement. He said, man is free to turn to Christ, but he is not able. A very famous Calvinist, James White, said this, the reformed assertion is that man cannot understand and embrace the gospel, nor respond in faith and repentance toward Christ without God first freeing him from sin and giving him spiritual life. Now, young people, listen to me. You say, well, Pastor Marty, that sounds like it could be biblical. Listen carefully. In order to be saved, you must believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, finish it with me, and thou shalt be saved. Acts 16, 31. Listen carefully. You are not regenerated or born again until you have believed. But Calvinism strangely teaches that in order to believe, you have to be born again before you believe. Someone says, Pastor Monty, is that a misrepresentation? Oh, no, not at all. Edwin Palmer, who is a very famous Calvinist, said this. He said, once the sinner is born again, he can for the first time turn to Jesus, asking Jesus to save him. Now, some of you are thinking, wait a minute, Pastor Monty, you get saved by trusting in Christ, and then you're born again. That is exactly what the Bible teaches. Calvinism does not teach that. It teaches an opposite approach. The famous Reformed Bible teacher R.C. Sproul says, quote, A cardinal point of Reformed theology is the maxim, regeneration precedes faith. Now, now, now wait just a minute. I know when I was saved. I listened to the gospel message, and the Holy Spirit of God convict me, convicted me and drew me. And I'll have more to say about that in a moment. But I did not get saved until I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ for salvation. Why? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth should not perish but have everlasting life. The condition to salvation then is believing and trusting. One is not born again until he has believed or until he has trusted. Total depravity or total inability, as defined by the Calvinists, requires regeneration before faith and salvation. And some Calvinists say this regeneration. That's another way of saying being born again. Some Calvinists say that this will take place in infancy. I want everyone listening carefully to what I'm about to say. An infant cannot receive Christ as Savior because he cannot comprehend the gospel message. An infant cannot exercise faith. But a famous Calvinist, very popular today, has written this, quote, Regeneration can take place in the smallest of infants in the sphere of the covenant of God. He usually regenerates his elect children from infancy. And I would ask you a question. Where is that found on the pages of the Bible? You see, the issue here is not something of Calvinism versus Arminian. The issue is what does the Bible say? And I can find nowhere in the scripture that teaches that an infant is born again simply by God touching him in some form or fashion. In fact, to teach so could possibly give someone a false assurance of salvation. Famous radio teacher R.C. Sproul has written, quote, The reformed view of predestination teaches that before a person can choose Christ, he must be born again. One does not first believe and then become reborn. And I ask you tonight, what does the Bible say? 
In every example in the Bible, we find where an individual gets saved, personal faith in Christ is exercised and salvation is the result. Remember when Philip was dealing with the Ethiopian eunuch and they came to water and Philip saw the water and the Ethiopian eunuch paused and he said, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said this, if thou believest, thou mayest. The issue is always one of belief. Belief precedes salvation. According to Jesus, it is not the refusal of man to turn to God. His refusal to turn to God is not a result of his inability, but rather his unwillingness. Now here is the problem. God did not create me incapable of a response to the gospel. My sinfulness makes me unwilling. We'll deal with how God works through that in a moment. But I am not enabled. Jesus said, ye will not come unto me that ye might have eternal life. John 5, 40. Not ye cannot come, but ye will not come. It is a matter of the will that is the problem. When Jesus wept over the city of Jerusalem, he said, how often would I have gathered thy children together and ye would not. He didn't say, and ye could not. He said, and ye would not. Jesus invited all to come to him in Revelation 22, verse 17. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Whosoever will. There's no limitation on that. A matter of the will, a matter of the choice. Jesus said, if any man thirst, let him come unto me. The invitation is very, very clear. You say, well, pastor, what is God's part? Oh, God initiates salvation. Don't misunderstand. I hear someone Calvinistic saying, well, Pastor Monty, then salvation depends wholly upon man. Oh, no, by no means. It is Christ who died on the cross. He shed his blood. God provided the sacrifice. But God initiates salvation in our heart, not by dragging us to Christ, but by drawing us to him. There's something in theology known as prevenient grace, or the grace that all men experience. I think that there are four chief avenues through which this grace of God's drawing humanity comes. The first one is Christ himself. The Bible tells us that all men receive light from Christ. He is the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. John 1, verse number 9. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. Titus 2, 11. There is a drawing grace. Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. When Jesus is lifted up in the preaching of the cross, there is a drawing power that comes to all men, not just to select few, but to all. Christ is one of the means by which men understand salvation and, of course, come and are drawn to him. Not only that, but creation. The Bible teaches that man is without excuse because of the revelation of God in nature. We're familiar with that. Romans 1, verses 19 and 20. There is no excuse because God has revealed himself. Man's conscience. We have an inner witness that bears witness to the righteousness of God. Romans 2 verses 11 through 16. That is a drawing power. Before I got saved, my conscience troubled me. Why? The Holy Spirit of God was dealing with that conscience, that sense of right and wrong. And then the fourth thing, conviction. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit will come to reprove the world, not just certain individuals, but the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. John 16 verse 8. It is not a matter of my inability to decide for Christ. It is a matter of my unwillingness. Think with me for a moment, if you will, tonight. Acts 16, verse 31. The simple words, Paul spoke them to the Philippian jailer, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. This man had seen the testimony of Paul. He had heard the singing in the night. He had heard the gospel. God was convicting and drawing. He came to personal faith in Jesus Christ. And then the gift of eternal life was received. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. I am concerned because the Calvinist order of salvation is very different from that. In fact, they really turn that verse around to read, Be saved and thou shalt believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you believe that man is totally unable to exercise his will when stirred by the Holy Spirit of God and wooed by Christ to come to salvation, if you believe that, then obviously God must do something to change that in an individual. The Calvinist believes that God chooses certain select sinners to be saved, effectively damning the rest. 
He believes that God regenerates certain select sinners, causes them to be born again without even knowing it. As we read a moment ago, one scholar said this happens in infancy. Some of them teach this happens at the moment that an infant is baptized. All of a sudden, they're zapped, they're born again. I read one particular scholar who said an individual becomes born again perhaps just by walking down the street and never has any contact with the Bible, the gospel, or any Christian witness at all, but all of a sudden God regenerates him, and he is now born again so that when he hears the gospel, he will receive it. It is believed by the Calvinists that God gives faith to certain select sinners because they are incapable of exercising faith on their own. And then these certain select sinners, having been born again and having been given the gift of faith, they finally come to believe and are saved. Now look at your Bible again, Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 1. The Bible says this, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Aha, Pastor Monty, dead. Dead. Dead means dead. And I don't know how many scholars I have read over the last years that have likened this spiritual deadness to the deadness of a corpse. But may I remind you, young people, there are several kinds of deadness in the Bible. There is physical deadness. That is when my body stops functioning, I die. Probably after the last White Castle hamburger I'll eat. I'll die with a White Castle in my hand. That's my plan anyway. What a way to go to heaven with a White Castle in your hand. When I die, my body, all 200 and none of your business pounds of it, are going to be <laughs> laid out here, or not here, I'm hoping not right here. I don't want to end before the sermon's done tonight. That body will be dead because soul and spirit have departed. The physical body is left alone. Now watch this. There is a separation between soul and spirit, okay? We are not talking about physical death in verse number one because none of us were just dead and then were resurrected physically. You say, what are we talking about? We're talking about spiritual death. Where do we find that? Remember when God spoke to Adam and Eve and he warned them? He said, in the day you eat of the tree of the garden of good and evil. He said, in the, the day that you shall eat thereof, ye shall surely die. Now let me ask every one of you a question. On the day that they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, did they all fall over as if they had a White Castle hamburger in their hand? No, it didn't happen. They did not die physically. Did God not keep his word? Of course God kept his word. Pastor Mahdi, what happened? They died spiritually. Spiritual deadness. Physical alive. Because soul and spirit are still united with body. Physically they were alive. But that spirit died. The spirit no longer communed in perfect fellowship with God. Aha! They couldn't understand God. Well, have you read in the book of Genesis that after the fall, God came to them and rebuked them and they actually communicated with God? You see, spiritual deadness does not limit the ability of God to communicate to an individual and to present him with a choice to receive Christ as his Savior. The essence of death is separation. In physical death, the soul and spirit are separated from the body. In spiritual death, the spirit of man is separated from God. But that spirit of man, as the Holy Spirit works in his heart, as the word of God is preached, Jesus draws him, he can still respond just like Adam and Eve responded to God. You say, do you have another example from the scripture? I'm so glad you asked. In the Bible, in the New Testament, Luke chapter 16, we read of the rich man and Lazarus. Remember, the rich man died and was buried and went to hell. In hell, the Bible says that he carried on a... Con you say, was he a dead man? Yes, physically dead and spiritually dead. Represented as being spiritually dead. And yet he carried on a conversation with God. There was that thing about him that was consciousness. That consciousness remained and he could still turn. You say, Pastor, what does the Bible teach? We are dead, spiritually dead. But on hearing the gospel, we can come to Christ. Look, if you will, Ephesians 1, verse number 12. Ephesians 1, verse 12. That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ... In whom, ye, in whom ye also trusted, now notice the order, 
after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You say, what is the order? You hear the word of truth, the gospel. You believe the gospel by trusting in Christ, and you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That is the biblical order. Dr. R.C. Sproul makes a shocking admission. He says this, quote, If some people are not elected unto salvation, then it would seem that God is not at all that loving toward them. Further, it would seem that it would have been more loving of God not to have allowed them to be born. That may indeed be the case. Pastor, why is that? Listen carefully. If you are truly enabled to respond to the gospel message, and only certain people are made able by this pre-salvation regeneration, then the multitude of people, according to Matthew chapter 7, will never come to Christ, not because they don't want to, but because they can't. They are unable to receive Christ as Savior. Well, now, Pastor Monty, salvation is offered to all. Yes, but God is no fool, and I speak reverently. If you are not able to respond to the message, then it is not much of a message for it to be offered. Uh, let me see. I need, a, I need a, a good volunteer. Let's see. The fellow right there. No, I'll take the guy in the pink tie. That pink tie stands out to me, okay? Just stand up right there. Stand up. You're a student of this college. What year are you? Senior. senior. Do you know what seniors need? What is this? Money. It's my wallet. Well, it's a wallet. It's a preacher's wallet, so there's not much money. <laughs> you know, um, I have a $20 bill. Wouldn't a, wouldn't a senior like a $20 bill? You could do a lot with this. What's your name? Micah. 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 Good to meet you, Micah. $20 bill. I've worked hard for this. The fact of the matter is, I don't know Micah, but I like his tie. I think it takes great courage for a man to wear a tie like that. You can turn around so the audience can see what... Okay. Mike, I've worked hard for this. You might say I've earned this $20 bill. But um, I'd like to give it to you as a free gift. You would like that? You wouldn't buy another tie with it, would you? I hope you'll put it on your college bill. I'd like to give it to you as a free gift. So here's what I need you to do. Sprout wings. Sprout wings. And fly up here and get it. Sprout wings. Sprout wings, Micah. Now right away, right away, your sense of justice, I know I, you say, Pastor Monty, come on. He can't possibly sprout wings and fly up here. Well, I said, look, if you're going to get the 20 bucks, sprout wings. Well, Pastor Monty, your offer is no good because you know he can't. What if God offers salvation to the whole world according to the Calvinist system, knowing full well that the vast majority could never accept because they are incapable are you following me? If I tell him that I'll give him, and, and keep your eyes on this, if I, <laughs> if I tell Micah that I'm going to give him this $20 bill, and yet I expect him to do something I know he cannot do in order to receive that, isn't my offer pretty disingenuous? And you'd be sitting out there thinking, yeah, Pastor Monty, put the money back, because Micah can't grow wings and fly. If God offers salvation to the entire world and knows that you can't receive it, that you are incapable of receiving it, that offering it to you is a total impossibility because you can never receive it, if God offers it on that basis, doesn't that sound like a sham offer to you? Doesn't sound like much of an offer to me. Now, God doesn't offer salvation on that basis. God says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever, let him come unto me. Now, Micah, because God doesn't make you sprout wings, I'm going to give you 20 bucks. There you go. Just don't buy another tie with it. <laughs> Our God is honest in his offer. 
And when he says that any and all may come, indeed any and all may come. I was thinking the other day, and I'll close with this thought, about uh, swimming. My dad was old school. When I was about nine years old, my dad decided to teach me to swim by pushing me off a dock. And he was right there, and, and that was a good thing. I didn't know how to swim, but I sure learned fast, real quick. How, anyone have a parent that did that to you? They just pushed you in? Yeah, sadistic, isn't it? Um, but I learned quickly how to swim. And we laugh about that because there was that struggle and dad was right there and, you know, it was in reality safe. What if, um, what if a parent took a baby, an infant baby, and threw that baby into the water and said, swim, swim. That baby couldn't swim. There's no coordination there. There's no thinking of moving the feet and the arms. That baby would just begin to swing, uh, to sink. Why? There's absolutely no ability whatsoever. That baby cannot swim. And what if I stood there as a father and threw an infant into the water and I said, swim, 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 swim. The baby can't swim. So, Pastor Mata, you'd be a murderer. You'd be a psychopath. You'd be a, some of you are thinking that right now, you Calvinists are. You'd be deranged and you'd be cruel. How could you tell someone who can't that they must? Listen to me. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Salvation comes by personal faith. All are invited to come. But if you preach a message that says only a select few, and no man is capable of coming to Christ, and yet you call upon men to believe, you are telling someone to swim when they cannot swim. Hear me and I'm done. The gospel is good news. Not just to a select handful, but good news to whosoever believeth on him. And let me tell you something, young people. The best news in the world, I can walk up to any person in this room, any person in Pensacola, Florida, I can look them square in the eye, and I can say, Christ died for you. And you need to receive him as your savior. And the Holy Spirit of God can work in that life. And that one can come to trust him as savior because God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Total inability? Oh, no. God says whosoever will may come.